Let's look today at red blood cells. Everybody's probably heard before that red blood cells largely have one very big job, transporting oxygen in the body. And notice how they transport around 98.5%, so that's practically all of it. That remaining 1.5% that's found in the plasma is pretty small and insignificant. We'll see how these reds use a protein to do this a little bit further along. Now notice when it comes to carbon dioxide, there's a very big difference in the percentage, right? It does not nearly transport all the CO2, only about 23% of it. So there we see how the oxygen is transported, right? By the reds, there's a protein called hemoglobin we'll look at here in a second that's responsible for that. But again, they get about 23% of the carbon dioxide. A small amount of it's dissolved in the plasma, just like oxygen is. But most of that CO2 is transported around the blood and body in the form of bicarbonate ion. Now, how does carbon dioxide get into the form of bicarbonate ion? That leads us to one of the, one of the most discussed chemical reactions in any anatomy and physiology book. And if we look at this chemical reaction, we can see that carbon dioxide quickly combines with water. There will always be water around this gas. So this is going to happen rapidly. This will get together to form H2CO3, carbonic acid, and this acid will quickly dissociate, in other words, break down into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. So here we see the CO2 over on the left. Here we have it over here in the center and back over here to the right inside the bicarbonate ion. So through this chemical reaction, that is how most of the CO2 gets into this bicarbonate ion form. Also, with this reaction, it's discussed quite a bit because the CO2 is on one side of this and the hydrogen's on the other. If you ever take a chemistry class, when you see these arrows pointing in both directions, that means you have a reversible chemical reaction. And that tells you that the material on both sides of those arrows, left and right, are always going to work to balance out, reaching an equilibrium. So that tells us whatever happens to CO2 levels in the body also happens to hydrogen. One rises, the other rises. One goes down, the other one goes down. So we'll see a lot more on that further along in other chapters, especially when it comes to the respiratory system. Now let's look at the hemoglobin molecule. This is the very abundant protein that's found inside the red blood cells that transports that oxygen. There's two different types of hemoglobin that we make in our life. We have an embryonic back before we're born and then an adult soon afterwards. The reason we need two different types of hemoglobin is because before we're born, we're not moving air in and out of our lungs. We don't need a hemoglobin that's good at taking oxygen from the air. We need one that's good at taking oxygen from adult hemoglobin. We'll see the little barrier that this happens across in another video. So we need this one type of hemoglobin that's good at taking oxygen from adult hemoglobin before we're born. But the problem with this one is that it's not good at taking oxygen from atmospheric air, right? The oxygen you find in the air that we breathe, which is oxygen and nitrogen. So as soon as we're born, our body stops making this embryonic hemoglobin and swaps over to the adult. And this also explains why you see a lot of jaundice in newborns. With newborns, we try to get rid of this embryonic hemoglobin as fast as we can. Whenever we're losing a very large number of red blood cells, it can somewhat overload the liver because the liver gets rid of those waste products. And anytime those waste products build up in the body, that can cause jaundice. So that's pretty commonly seen with newborns. It's going to happen as we get rid of that embryonic hemoglobin, and usually no harm is done. But looking more at this hemoglobin molecule, you'll see that it has these four globin parts. That's the protein portion right there. And you can see that this part here transports the carbon dioxide and the nitric acid. These are waste products built up inside of tissues as cells go through normal metabolism. And these waste products are very good at causing vasodilation. That will cause a lot more blood to move through an area. But in addition to this protein part in a hemoglobin, you also have these four heme group molecules. And right in the center of each one of those is an iron atom. Iron is very good at transporting oxygen. So since each hemoglobin has four heme molecules and each one of those has one iron, that means that each hemoglobin can transport four oxygen. There are many hemoglobin molecules inside any red blood cell. 
And then we have trillions of reds inside the body. That means we can move a whole lot of oxygen. This iron is recycled and used over and over again. Liver and spleen are really good at holding on to that material and allowing us to use it over and over. But let's also look a little here at erythropoiesis. Remember, this refers to the creation of red blood cells. Now, if you look at how all this begins, it often starts with the kidneys. A lot of people don't realize that your kidneys are always monitoring your blood oxygen levels. And if at any time, for any reason, oxygen levels are inadequate, the kidneys will release a hormone called erythropoietin. This chemical right here will enter the blood, travel through it, and eventually it's going to make its way to the bone marrow. And remember, in the bone marrow, this is where the cells of the blood are made. We still have stem cells here. So that erythropoietin will tell these stem cells to make more red blood cells. And of course, as you get more red blood cells being produced, that will increase your oxygen delivery and raise it right back up. Simple negative feedback. Low oxygen levels stimulated all this, this will raise them right back up. The red blood cells only live about 110 to 120 days. The reason being, they lose their nucleus when they're being made. You'll often hear about red blood cells not having a nucleus. Well, that's a little misleading. All cells do have one at some time in their life, and most will retain them. But reds will lose it very earlier in their life. They do this so they can make more room for hemoglobin. So that gives them an advantage. They can transport more oxygen. But when the cell loses the nucleus, it loses its ability to repair itself. And that's why they don't live too long. Notice how we make about two and a half million reds every second? It's because we're generally losing about the same number. It comes out to about less than 1% per day. So the average adult might have somewhere around 25 trillion reds. It's largely dependent on the size of the individual. And some of the important materials needed to make the red blood cells and all that hemoglobin, the iron we mentioned before, if you want to transport that oxygen, you got to have that iron in those heme groups. But you also need a lot of this B12 and folate. These materials here are largely needed for DNA synthesis. If you want to make a cell, you got to make a nucleus, you got to make DNA. So that's why this material is needed. You often hear about these being needed for energy production. That's absolutely incorrect. It's misleading there. So as we lose all these reds, all this hemoglobin spills out, but that's all right. A large amount of it is used over and over again. Macrophages, largely in the liver and the spleen, will break this material down. And anything which can be reused, like the iron, the proteins, anything such as that, will just be recycled over and over again. But there's also this waste product called bilirubin, which needs to be removed at this time. And the liver largely does that. Whenever the liver can't remove this material fast enough, maybe the bilirubin is being released due to a large number of red blood cells dying at one time, or maybe the liver's been damaged, that can lead to jaundice, that's that yellowish material that you can often see building up in the skin of someone at that time. So that's just a little overview of red blood cells, some of the major things about them. We'll continue with more of this in another video.